I'm Lily Geraldo, and I'm the program manager for Cladera Cares, and I'm pleased to introduce Urvashi Sani. Uh, we'll be hearing from her today. Um, Urvashi is incredibly accomplished, and so I'm only going to share a small snippet of her, of her bio, but just to give you some background. Dr. Urvashi Sani is a social entrepreneur, women's rights activist, and educationist who has been active in the field for more than three decades. She's a leading expert in school governance, curriculum reform, and teacher training with a special focus on girls' education and equality. Urvashi founded uh, Saraksha, which is a women's rights organization. She also founded Didi's, a social enterprise for sustainable livelihoods for women, and the Study Hall Educational Foundation. And currently, she is the founder, president, and CEO of CHEF. And over the last three decades, Dr. Sani's work through CHEF and its schools and outreach initiatives has impacted more than 100,000 teachers and 5 million children, most of whom are girls from disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities. Um, and, and during today's presentation, Urbashi will share how a school curriculum that includes teaching lessons of equality has helped change the course of the lives of girls and boys, their families, and the lives of those in their communities. Um, and so I'm going to stop there and I will welcome and pass it on to Urvashi. Thank you, Lily, and thank you, Claudia. And thank you, Claudera, for inviting me. Um, good morning, good evening. It's morning here in Lucknow, UP, India, where I'm speaking from. I'm going to tell you a story, really, of uh, this girl, Lakshmi, two girls, actually. So Lakshmi was nine when she had to drop out of school and start working in homes so that she could help take care of her four siblings and help sustain the family's uh, income. When she was 11, she walked up to uh, my Prerna school. And because it was in the afternoon, because it was only 10 rupees, which is about uh, 13 cents, I think, a month, and she could do all her work in the morning and yet come to school. And she came because she wanted a better life. At 13, her mother died and left her, left a one-year-old child. Her mother was only 35, by the way. And uh, there were four Lakshmi and her four brothers and sisters. Lakshmi put herself to work in seven homes. Her sister, who was 11, to work in three homes. Her brother was distributing tiffins and together they were raising this family. The father was an alcoholic and didn't have the call. And at the same time, she was coming to school, to our trade last school. Kushpu is this other child uh, who lost her mother when she was three. Then her during childbirth, child also died. Her father remarried and had two more daughters and mother died because when she was pregnant for a third time very rapidly and so she didn't want the child and her husband wouldn't allow to abort it. So she tried to abort herself and married. She married a third time and there are six daughters from that. And uh, Kushbu dropped out of school. She was, she's the eldest daughter and she was in class five because she had to take care of all these siblings and help with them. And then she, Lakshmi told her about Prerna and she again walked up here and enrolled herself because she wanted a better life. These are both young women now, but I'll tell you a little later what happened with them. So Lakshmi and Kushbu and many girls like that fought in the intersection, cruel intersection of caste, gender, and poverty in India were in our school. And as I looked at them, I was sure that yes, it was a good thing that they came and they had access and they were coming to school. But you know, business as usual wasn't going to help. I looked, reflected on my own education. I come from a middle class family and my parents are refugees from Pakistan, were refugees from Pakistan, very patriarchal family. They sent me to school and I went to a very good private school and it, it was number one in the country for girls' schools. And I topped my class. And one year later, I was engaged and married off and shipped off a thousand kilometers away to Lucknow. And I knew that my education, though it was considered a high quality education I finished, was not a high quality. It shortchanged me because it taught me many academic skills, but didn't give me the one important lesson 
that had I caught, it would have changed the course of my life. That I was an equal person and that I had the right to use these academic skills for my life and to choose the direction of my own life. I was engaged to a man I almost barely knew and I didn't see, didn't even think to question it. I didn't like it. I, I know as I was growing that um, I would iron everybody's clothes and my brothers would play, go out to play cricket. My brothers went to college and went for uh, you know, chemistry and uh, engineering and all great courses and I was And I never thought to question it. It was much later when I was 28 and for myself and actually spurred by a personal tragedy that I understood, got this <gasps> insight. I said, you know, it was in the middle of the night, I remember, and I said, ah, oh, you know what? I'm an equal person and I have the right to choose the direction of my life. And I was careful enough not to say this out loud because I knew that it would not be accepted. It would not be welcomed. Yes. So I looked at my girls in trade now. And I said, you know, yes, they need an education. They should have a better life. But what is most important is that they must learn the lesson that took me so long to learn. That they are equal persons. They have the right to choose the direction of my, their life and they deserve respect. They deserve everything. And which is why in our school, in Prerna, which now has a thousand girls, we started with 30. We teach very importantly as part of our educational goal. It's very clear to us that none of our girls must graduate from school without learning, without developing a feminist consciousness. And what does that mean? Without learning that they are equal persons. Most important lesson to learn because once you get that, you become the driver of your own life. And that, you know, life is very unequal. Societies are very unequal, especially patriarchal families like us. But that is not a natural thing. Many subordinate people, women, Dalits, black people, they believe that this is the natural way you should be. All oppressed classes, that it's some kind of an order of nature that it is a social and historical construct. It was humanly constructed and it can be deconstructed and you can imagine an egalitarian society where you have, you can live a life of your own choosing and flourish. So then I put together what I call a critical feminist pedagogy, drawing from Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy. He was a revolutionary and educator, philosopher, Brazilian, great, my hero and who believed that education should be about life. It should be contextualized in our lives. And, but he was also, it was all about men. That's the one beef I have against him. And I layered my feminist thinking on it. And I said, you know, we should be, Lakshmi wants a better life and she should have one. But, so that is why we should be aiming at life outcomes and not just learning outcomes. So we then, what did we do in terms of critical feminist pedagogy? But once a week, we would sit in circles, we call them culture circles, and we would talk about our lives, about the domestic violence, about child, the danger of child marriage, about how unfair things were. And the idea of talking about your lives was that you were naming your reality, again, fair is traits. And he believed that if you name your reality, you can transform it. And believe me, I saw that happen in front of my eyes. But as they were naming their reality, they were almost beginning to understand what was happening to them. And the goal of the teacher was to facilitate, to ask the question that are never asked. To give you an example, when you talk about uh, domestic violence, so I, and uh, many it's rampant in India and all over the world, I know, that, uh, okay, so uh, your mother, your father beats your mom. All right. So I said, all right, then, then does your mom ever beat your dad? You know, they were kind of shocked. They laughed. And they said, well, of course not. I said, well, it's supposing someone were to beat her when she's out on the street, what would she do? He said, yeah, she would defend herself. And she, I said, so why not at home? He said, you know, it's just not allowed. That's not what good women do. You know, so when the, the facilitator's role is to ask these unaskable questions almost and get them to realize that this is unfair. And that, you know, and so when they, they said, but society won't allow it. So then to ask the question, so who is the society? And if you are a member of society, it was formed. So it can be changed, you know, and we can protest. 
but slowly building a structural understanding of the inequality. But it is not individuals, not their father or brother alone. Yes, it's them. But it's a social system and a social structure which is unequal. And that needs to be responded to. And that they have the right to protest. They don't even think they have the right to protest. I know I didn't. So we use a lot of drama. And the, the great thing about drama is it not only helps them express their feelings, it helps them leave them free to express their indignation in a safe way. There are no repercussions because we are acting, right? We are role playing. And yet, what does it do? It's rehearsing life. It's rehearsing resistance and protest. And at the same time, we play these, perform these for parents. And parents are beginning to see that how their daughters feel. And we have found that parents have changed their mind about child marriage, marrying their daughters off. When they saw this, I've seen fathers crying when children presented a play about paternal alcoholism. So that's what we do with the critical feminist pedagogy. We try to give them a voice, an agency, and teach them that they're equal citizens, that whatever their religion or their society might say, there is a constitution, and the constitution gives them equal rights, and as citizens, they have full rights and protections which they don't know about, which we teach them. So as a result of that, where are Lakshmi and Kushpi now? So Lakshmi not, is now, has now got an MBA. She just started her own business. And she has employed three more Prerna girls. Not just that. She has not given up on her alcoholic father, who continues to be an alcoholic. I wish she would give up on him. But she is carrying him along. All her sisters have got an education. One has finished college, two are finishing school. Kushbu, by the way is at when she was in class nine, her father tried to marry her off. She resisted. Class 10, he, she topped her class, but he wanted to marry her off. She defied him. He threw her out. He beat her. Her grandmother took her in. And then she supported herself. She got herself a bachelor's. She got herself a master's. And just recently, she bought herself a plot of land for 400,000 rupees, which, by the way, my daughters didn't do. And I really want to ask her, with that meager salary, God, you're a financial wizard. How did you do it? And they all say, and many girls, there are so many stories, I can't, we don't have the time. To it. And they all say that it was that important lesson of equality, where they said we were helped to construct a self that was equal, deserved respect. And that is what helped us protest. That is what gave us the courage to forge a pathway. And by the way, neither one of them is married. They're 26 and 27, and are convinced that they will marry out of choice when they want to. Our retention rates are 88%. Our transition to, high, to higher education is 100%, by the way. And now the master's is the new normal for all our girls. So it, it works. One, it works. Secondly, we decided, and pretty late in the day, I'll admit, because parents insisted that our boys, you know, what about our boys? My first response was, then mind the boys. But they said, no, 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 what about our boys? And then I said, hey, that's an opportunity. We can't have gender justice and gender equality unless boys learn to deconstruct patriarchal notions of gendered roles. So we, st we started working with critical feminist pedagogy with them too. And our goal was this. We told our boys, in a whole ethic of care that, listen, we care deeply about you and your lives, first. Secondly, patriarchy is not your fault, but it gives you unearned power and privilege. And it's very, very cruel to your sisters, your mothers, your aunts, all the women you love. Plus, it makes you, you know, it gives you a toxic sense of masculinity that unless you're violent, unless you're dominant, that you just aren't a good enough man. And that puts so much pressure on you. So shouldn't you change? And don't you care about how your sisters feel? And believe me, after we put them through this, the boys, they have started working, helping at home. And they came up with this prize comment. I said, so what did you learn? They said, you know, I've learned that girls are also people, persons, they have feelings. They're not just objects. Okay, and so they are responding differently, and not just that, they have become leaders in their own community. We have also started working on caste inequality, like race in other countries. Caste is one huge, shameful part of our Indian society. 
though it's illegal, the untouchability is illegal, but it still is practiced. And so there we are helping both the dominant caste groups and the Dalits, the oppressed castes, to deconstruct casteist notions in a patriarchal society. And this is, that is a work in progress. So what my point is, with telling you, the, my point of telling you this story is that, you know, we have one of the world's most progressive constitutions. After a long spell of colonial rule, we were freed in 1947. And in 1950, we gave to ourselves this great constitution. We, we do here, we, the people of India, do here by, you know, give to ourselves this constitution. And it promises equality to all our citizens, irrespective of caste, gender, religion, creed, is what it says. All right. 70 years later, is that constitution in practice? No. We have one of the world's worst indicators in terms of gender. It was named one of the most dangerous places to be a woman very recently. And casteist practices are rampant all over. It's almost part of the DNA of people. And why didn't our constitution, why wasn't it realized? What happened? And here's my take on it. I think, you know, whereas our founding parents worked really hard at giving us this great constitution in a country that was very feudal, that was very hierarchical, where equality was almost a foreign kind of a concept, right? Here's the thing they didn't do. They should have, at that time, 70 years ago, also made it mandatory for schools to teach their children about equality, teach them lessons of equality in the classrooms. Education is a radical space of possibilities. It's a hugely transformative force, very powerful. But only if we transform education. It depends on what you teach, why you teach, how you teach it. And we've lost a huge opportunity. Well, you know, in Hindi, there's this whole thing, which means better late than never late. That even now, if we can, we just had a new education policy again, very aspiration, talk about equity, inclusion, equality. But if, unless we change our curricula to make lessons of equality as important as lessons of math, science, geography, history, you know, the whole traditional stuff. And I don't see why they are not. Unless we make social justice a critical part of our education, we will once again miss the, uh, the opportunity. What happened with our students, because we are including lessons of equality, they are beginning to radicalize their view of themselves. They are beginning to see the, the many, many possibilities of their lives, and they are going for it. So, in fact, once we take those lessons, our work is really done, because then they drive the whole process. And so I think not just in India, but all over the world. Whereas everyone is very focused on artificial intelligence, nanoscience, technology, more math and science. Ooh, you know, we're going to change the world. Really, we have more math and science. We have more technology. We have everything. Look at the state of the world. Do we have a more equal world? Do we have a less violent world? Do we have a more democratic world? Why don't we? Why don't we? Because we haven't seen, we're teaching our kids everything, but we've never taught them how to be good democratic citizens. And why haven't we? How did we think that they would just kind of learn how? And so we should be including them. Thank you so much for all of you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to me. I have an ask. Lily said I could, and so I'm going to ask. Right. So help us. If you believe that truly education can transform lives, come visit us. We have interns from all over the world. Right now, we have two from Spain, one from the US, and they are working here with work visas, by the way. They just came as interns, as volunteers, and then they decided they loved it. Tariol Education Foundation is a very loving, inclusive, caring organization, and I welcome you. If you can't come, I'm hoping you donate. And let me tell you how little it costs. If for $500 US dollars, you can educate one girl in our study hall college for the whole year. 
without which and one dalit girl we will give it to a dalit girl for 1300 dollars so if you if you want to pull it and do that you can help a digital sathi and what does that mean this is a young woman who is equipped with a small laptop and internet connection and she can teach 15 girls who are out of school they've been married they have to drop out in their communities and get and she will get a small honorarium so i welcome you to come join us visit the interns and if not please do donate and if you want to know more about critical feminist pedagogy and how we do it and these are stories that the girls tell themselves i was a resident at brookings institution and they asked me to write this book about my school prerna it's called reaching for the sky it's available on amazon it's free thanks very much thank you so much um So if anyone has any questions please add them to the chat. Um I I also do want to say that right now as part of the Global Days of Service we're offering a 2 to 1 match for any charitable donations and so it'll effectively triple your donation so that's for employees who are who are who are listening. Um and let me see. So let's see we have a question from AB. Um Do you have a sense for the kind of impact effect that schools like Perna and your other programs had on the general state public educational methods and topics? Thank you for that question. In fact, you know, I've been advocating for a long time that gender education should be should become a part of the official curriculum, a compulsory part of it. And I am happy to say that the new education policy uh, talks about gender sensitivity. they are not going so far as to say gender education but gender sensitivity as part of the curriculum i'm on the steering committee of the new education policy for uttar pradesh and so i have really pushed that very hard apart from that what we've done is we partnered with a thousand schools girl schools and now 50 coed schools where we are training teachers in critical feminist pedagogy and including the training them on how they can include communities in these dialogues. we run a very large india's daughters campaign and that again you're welcome to join us go on our website tadihallfoundation.org where we are including students teachers communities and trying to get them to look at girls as equal citizens deserving respect and campaigning against gender based violence and child marriage in terms of what impact has it had on the communities around us what i can tell you about prerna and the communities that we serve you know we've had our the rate of child marriage has gone down dramatically and what i found is there are more fathers now involved in their daughters education bringing them on bikes okay to school so the it is a very very uh, it's centuries old and patriarchy is very much in place gender based violence is very much in place and it's going to take a lot of work all heads hearts and minds which is why i'm appealing to you and uh, uh, so the impact we see the impact again one life at a time but it's slow and i'm hoping that uh, you know with the new education policy with all our combined efforts it will go much further thank and the, you the men i have great hopes of that so we have 2 minutes i'm going to ask one more question um are there any acceptance criteria for the school are there any acceptance criteria what are the acceptance criteria for oh no no everybody is welcome Actually, but you know you have to be uh, below the part of poverty line and we are uh, give preference to dalits to girls who are uh, who are girls and boys who come from very very poor families and by the way boys only 150 we've kept it at that because we would like to spend our resources on the girls there are many families that are willing to spend money on their sons but not their daughters so we said well you know we will serve the girls who you don't spend anything on or you just don't care about so we do that otherwise there's no acceptance criteria we do test them but that's only to see where they would fit we also get girls who are 18 i had a girl who was 23 well a woman she was a mother of four i couldn't believe it and she was this tiny thing and she came with these four girls and i said well, your sister right? these are your sisters no no these are my daughters she was married at 13 
Okay, mother at 15, 17, 19, 21, and then her husband died, thank God. And so she was here with four. We put her in a bridge course. We have a bridge course also where 100 of these girls are an accelerated learning program. So the testing is only to see where we can place. Great, thank you so much. We are at time.